Welcome back to another volume of Truly Disturbing Tales from Reddit. Today we're going to be narrating three new unsettling stories taken directly from the platform. I encourage you all to sit back, grab a snack, and enjoy these terrifying personal accounts. Now, without any further delay, let's jump right in. This story took place in 2010. My child was four years old, and I'm 100% sure that my kid prevented something terrible from happening to me that day. Sort of a funny yet not funny twist to all of this is that this story was adapted into a Law & Order episode with a terrifying ending. By way of background, I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin which has the honor of being one of the most racially segregated cities in the country. It's a cool city overall, but we have a really shitty inner city with a ton of poverty and violence and gang activity. At the time that this happened, I was living in sort of an in-between area. Not the hood, but far from a super nice area either. I was a 22-year-old single mom. I lived in a ground floor apartment on one of the main streets of the city. When I'd arrive home from work, I'd park in the back alley behind my building. My front door faced the street, and I had a side door too, with a walkway running between my building and the one next door. Anyway, one day I got home in the middle of the afternoon on a Saturday with my kid. As we drove down the alley to get to my parking spot, I saw a guy in a hoodie sort of lurking around the area where I parked my car. It was weird because it was warm outside, yet he had his hood up. But there were a bunch of ne'er-do-well kids in the neighborhood, so whatever. It was definitely an odd place to just be standing, though. As I got close to the building and started pulling into my parking spot, he turned around and started walking towards the street, past my side door. He definitely left because I arrived. I figured that maybe he was just smoking a blunt or something. I didn't think anything further of it. I got my son and some bags out of the car, went the same way the guy had just taken to get to my side door. I didn't see him at all. My son and I went inside, and I was in the process of putting stuff down when my doorbell rang. I wasn't expecting anyone, but my mind immediately thought that it was this guy. Being young and naive, I answered the front door. It was indeed the same guy, still with his hood up. He smiled at me, but not in a super friendly way, more of a leer. He looked to be about 16, cornrows, fake gold grill that was studded with little fake diamonds. I regretted opening the door, but here I was, so I just went with it. Hi. He kept staring at me, yet said nothing. At this point, I saw another kid in a hoodie pacing behind him on the sidewalk and looking at us. I was quickly realizing that this was not a good situation. My son, who I had momentarily forgotten about, came up behind me. He did the shy kid thing where he stood behind me and poked his head out from behind my butt to look at the guy. Hoodie dude looked at him for a good couple of seconds and then trained his attention back at me. Yo, is Danielle around? I don't know who that is. Maybe try the other door. I gestured to my neighbor's door to my left. Oh, you sure? Yeah, sorry, and go to close my door. As I do, he leaves, walking in the opposite direction of my neighbor's door. Hoodie dude number two happened to follow him. I thought it was really weird that they didn't even try to check next door for Danielle. I thought the whole thing was really weird. My boyfriend got to my apartment a few minutes later, and I was glad to see him. He had this really old Jeep that he always parked out front on the main street. When he went out to go get something from his car shortly after he arrived, the car was gone. Now, car theft was a pretty common thing in this neighborhood, but stealing it from the main street in broad daylight, well, that was pretty ballsy. So we called the cops, filed a report, the whole nine. I told the cop about hoodie dudes since it seemed like it could be important. 
I was able to give a good description of the guy who came to my door asking for Danielle. I had no idea if it was relevant, but the fact that the Jeep was stolen shortly after these guys were around made it seem pretty relevant. That's where the story pauses for a couple of days. I got a call from a different cop with the downtown precinct. He told me that they had found the Jeep and, other than the ignition, the car was in perfect working order. He asked if I could come downtown to do a lineup, see if I could identify the people who had knocked on my door right before the Jeep got taken. That was weird. A lineup? For a stolen car? But I agreed. He asked if I could come down in a couple of days. Also weird. Why wouldn't they want me to do it right away? But I was mostly focused on the fact that doing a lineup was pretty f cool. So I go to the downtown precinct a couple of days later. The way this went seemed sort of unorthodox, but it was what it was. Two detectives took me into a dark room where a woman in her 50s was sitting with a young woman in a wheelchair. The young woman's lower leg was in a giant cast with this whole metal contraption surrounding it, with maybe a dozen metal rods going into the cast itself. At this point, I had no idea what was happening. The detectives instructed us that we weren't to say anything during the lineup, except if we wanted the guys to turn to their left or right or something like that. But we most definitely couldn't talk to each other at all. Okay, we ended up having to wait in the room for almost an hour, in the dark, awkwardly not speaking. They explained it was taking more time than anticipated to get 12 guys from the jail over to the precinct. Finally, we got started. They did two lineups and gave us forms to mark 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. There was a large window in front of us and they explained that the guys wouldn't be able to see us. They turned the lights on in the room behind that window and brought each guy in individually. I couldn't identify anyone in the first lineup. I sort of felt bad actually, but I couldn't. The second lineup started and I didn't recognize guys one, two, or three. Number four came out though and I immediately recognized the dude who had knocked on my front door. He didn't have his stupid grill in anymore, but it was definitely the guy. After the second lineup was done, they brought the other two women into the hallway and told me to stay put. After a few minutes, they came back to get me. The detectives asked if I recognized anyone, and I told them that I was sure about number four in the second lineup, although I couldn't identify anyone in the first. I had gathered by this point that hoodie dude number two had likely been in the first lineup, but I hadn't gotten a good look at him when he was pacing on the sidewalk. They had me sign two forms, one for each lineup, with the second form identifying number four as hoodie dude number one. When I gave the forms back, the detective told me that he could tell me what was actually going on now that the lineup was done. Good, because I was officially confused as fuck by this point. He explained that number four was indeed one of the guys they arrested with my boyfriend's Jeep. The guys had stolen the Jeep and driven to a nearby part of town, into a quiet and lily-white neighborhood. For what it's worth, I'm also white, and this is relevant. They came across a young couple unloading groceries from their car. The young woman with the leg contraption was the female half of that couple. They parked the stolen Jeep behind the couple got out, and immediately shot them both. They shot the woman in the leg, and they shot the young man in, well, the man parts. He was still in the hospital in bad condition, which is why he wasn't there. The older woman was the girl's mom, and had brought her from the hospital just to do the lineup. The reason that it was delayed a couple of days was because the girl had to have emergency surgery to try and fix the damage to her leg. The guys didn't demand anything from the couple or take anything from them after the shooting. They just immediately shot them. The young woman managed to remember the license plate number of the Jeep. And the suspects were apprehended in a corner store when a cop saw the stolen car parked outside shortly after the shooting. Both shooters were teenagers, yet 
Both were being charged as adults. One of them had stupidly talked a bit before lawyering up, and had told a detective that this was a gang initiation. They had to shoot a white person. That was the price of admission. They had stolen my boyfriend's car after taking the bus out to the street that I lived on. They had figured that it would be easier to get away if they had wheels. The detectives were pretty sure that I had been the original target of opportunity, but couldn't explain why they hadn't gone through with it. I knew why. It was because he saw my kid peeking out from behind me. They told me I might have to testify if the case went to court, and told me that I'd hear from the DA's office when they needed me. A couple of months later, one of the detectives called me and told me that the hoodie dudes pled out to attempted murder charges in exchange for reduced time. I never asked how many years, but I assume that they're probably still in prison 13 years later. And for those who wonder, the guy who got shot in the nether region survived. As an ironic postscript to this story, my boyfriend had the same Jeep stolen from the same spot in front of my apartment about four months later, also in broad daylight. That time, the authorities didn't find it right away. He was staying over at my house weeks later when he got a call around 2 a.m. from the arson unit. Whoever had taken it had torched it and left it in the middle of the street in a notoriously violent area of the city. I moved shortly after that. It was Christmas time a year or two back when this story unfolded. My wife and I were staying at her childhood home where her mother now lived all alone. Well, not if you include all the cats. The house was on a quiet cul-de-sac in the suburbs. If you're picturing freshly mowed lawns, American flags, and empty sidewalks, you're picturing it right. It's a single-story home with an attached garage out front. The garage has two doorways, apart from the electric garage door, of course. One leads to the garden and backyard. This door has an old doggy door from their days with dear old Max. Side note, RIP Max. They had covered that doggy door with a piece of nailed-in wood. That had always made me slightly uncomfortable before, but I figure it had been that way for years, so what's the worst that could happen? The second door from the garage leads to the kitchen. Hollow core door. It could stop a mouse, but not much else. Definitely not something that wanted in, or someone. We were sound asleep in my wife's childhood bedroom at the front of the house. 3 a.m. I was in that deep, dark recess of sleep. You know, you're in the diving bell, and you're submerged hundreds of meters below the surface in black water, protected from the real world by miles of nothingness. But that's when I heard it. The scream. What are you doing? It was my mother-in-law's voice echoing down the hallway. To me, lost in a sea of sleep, it sounded like a jet engine roaring right past my eardrum. I bolted up. What happened next? happened in a matter of seconds. But about that scream, even though I was dead asleep, I heard enough of it to sense an urgency behind it. This wasn't an, oh, you scared me, type of scream. This was different, and I knew it. Not consciously, but my lizard brain, that piece we retained from our primitive ancestors, knew that something was wrong. I watch and read a fair amount of true crime, and this scream awakened that horrible fear within me. The one that says, this can't really be happening to me, can it? Honestly, in that second of the night, it sounded like someone was about to be murdered. You ever wonder if you're a fight or flight type of individual? I always have, and I came to know something about myself after this night. I'm a fighter. I leaped out of bed growled, yes, growled, in the manliest voice I could muster. I'm gonna kill you, mother and took off running. I tore open the bedroom door and ran into the hallway. There, at the end, I saw my mother-in-law, nightgown on, 
look of utter shock on her face, standing as still as a mannequin. We make eye contact as I continue towards her. Then she turns her head, looks directly into the kitchen. I hurry past her and round the corner into the kitchen. The hollow core door is absolutely obliterated, shards everywhere. I look through the open frame and see that the electric garage door is open. I push ahead. As I run into the garage, I hear it. The sound of someone hopping into a running car just out of view. And just as I make it out onto the driveway, I can see a car peeling out from the sidewalk adjacent to the house. But my adrenaline is still pumping. And who am I to say no to adrenaline? So, like an idiot, I run, barefoot, after the car. I give it a good go, but I'm no Usain Bolt, and even he couldn't catch a speeding car. It soon vanishes down the street, and I'm left all alone. The police showed up within a few minutes, which, I have to say, makes me feel a lot more at ease with my mother-in-law living there. They took our statements. My mother-in-law said she heard a noise, the hollow core door being kicked in and walked into the kitchen where she encountered the burglar, a small framed woman. The police theorized she was working as a part of a team. Her job was to squeeze through the doggy door, kick in the hollow core, and open the electric garage door for her accomplices. I'd say that this was backed up by the fact that when my mother-in-law came face to face with this woman burglar, she could easily see the large, dark silhouettes of two people behind this woman, still waiting to push in from the garage. According to the police, the burglar team most likely thought that nobody was home. Fortunately, my mother-in-law must have caught them off guard and scared them, in addition to my manly growl, of course. But it feels good to know that everyone was safe, and to learn that I guess I've got a little fight in me. And for the record, we bought the heaviest damn wooden door you've ever seen to replace that hollow core. I'd like to see a mouse try and get through that. My goal in sharing this story is twofold. One, to remind everyone to stay safe out there. And two, don't forget to practice your growls. There's no telling when they may come in handy. TV shows and movies usually depict abductors driving white or black vans. This is something that I didn't realize until I decided to buy a white 1994 Dodge Ram cargo van to haul some of the gear I needed for work. While driving it, I've been pulled over by cops and searched three different times for no reason. But that is for another story. The point is, some people see vans as very suspicious. One day, while returning home, a woman pushing a stroller stared at me for a long time while I drove along my home street. We have speed bumps, and I had a lot of expensive, delicate gear in the van, so I was purposely driving very slow. She stared at me, wide-eyed, the entire time. So I smiled at her, like a friendly neighbor would. She was staring so intently she almost walked the stroller right off the edge of the curb. I thought it was funny, but just as quick as I got a laugh, I had almost forgotten about it. A week later, our HOA email thread heats up when a resident sends out a notice that his wife and toddler were being stalked by a man in a white van. Fearing a pitchfork and torch mob mistaking me for the creeper, I replied to all, saying that I live in the neighborhood and also drive a white van, I even provided my license plate number and home address. Big mistake. Jokingly, I added that I also witnessed a suspicious person in the neighborhood. A woman with a stroller who was staring at me so long and hard that it made me uncomfortable. I provided the date and time of the incident to see if their alleged stalker was actually me. It was, and apparently, my snide email had triggered the husband of that woman. He began sending email after email, CCing everyone on the list, telling me that he can, quote, 
read between the lines of what I was saying. His accusations became more and more ludicrous and turned into personal attacks. Several neighbors on the email list replied that he was behaving badly. The emails eventually stopped, but things did get even weirder. On several occasions while out walking my dog, a girl around the age of 10 would come out of her house, run over to me, awkwardly chat me up about my dog, and give me strangely intimate details of her life. I wondered why this child was talking to strangers but thought that maybe she knew me from the neighborhood, so I politely played along. Then one day the girl shows up at my house. She said she was angry because her dad wouldn't let her have a dog like mine, so she wanted to visit my dog for a while. I told her that I needed to talk to her parents before I could ever let her visit my home like this. She said okay, left, and I never saw her anymore. I have two daughters though, and one of their friends told me that the girl that was chatting me up is the daughter of the triggered dude from the HOA email list. He had been sending her out to talk to me while he stood back and took pictures. My daughter's friend was friends with this bait girl the poor girl's dad was making his own daughter uncomfortable, which is why she confided in her friend. The dad was sending his daughter out to chat with me, so he could accuse me of I don't know what. One detail I forgot to mention. I have dash cams in all my vehicles and CCTV monitoring my front door. So the initial incident with the wife, as well as the girl coming to my door, were all recorded. I emailed the trigger dude and kindly offered him copies of the videos of each incident. I also told him I was concerned that his daughter was behaving inappropriately towards strangers. Apparently, this shorted out his plan, as I never heard from him, his daughter, or his staring wife ever again. <laughs>